Greetings. T today's talk is focused on the fact that Tesla has announced as of November 30th that they're offering $50 in cash and $50 in stock for each share uh, outstanding for those bonds that are expiring on March 1st. The impact of the news is that it actually elevated the stock price uh, by about 10 bucks when it occurred. And we kind of explored today sort of what's going on with that, why, and things to think about related to it. The second thing that we cover today is somewhat in the investment realm as well, which is the fact that um, it turns out that Tesla has some very interesting strategies when it comes to real estate. And the suggestion I want to make is that Tesla really violates what's called the McDonald's real estate strategy, and we'll kind of explore that as well uh, in terms of investments. At the end of today's show, we actually have some homework for those of you who are doing our class on options that I think you'll find interesting as well. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. If this is your first time on our channel, please take time to like and subscribe if you like the show. Also, please note that um, we're on Patreon because you support there if you would. Um, and note that uh, by watching uh, 10 seconds of our ads, it definitely helps to support the success of the channel. So what news came out yesterday that Tesla has decided to, so the, the big overhang on what's going on at Tesla right now is what's going to happen with the expiring or, or the bonds that are expiring where $920 million is due as of March 1st. Um, the answer to this has come out from Tesla in that they're going to offer half stock and half cash. So the basics are, as long as Tesla's stock price is above $360, Tesla has the right to sort of make offers, etc. The If the stock drops below $360, they're then stuck simply paying the $920 million due and then getting on with business. So it's exciting to see that Tesla actually is in a good position right now relative to this situation. And with the stock being at 363, it definitely fits the parameters um, of what the convertible bonds were about. So for those of you who don't know what a convertible bond is, um, in this case, uh, a convertible bond was issued by Tesla um, in order to, um, it, it basically is a bond. It, it pays four times a year a dividend and um, the strike price or par price is $360. Um, Tesla decided to issue a convertible bond because um, it had some downsides to it, but the best part of it was basically lower interest rates on those bonds. And so right now we're in the conversion period. So the question that came up was, should Tesla, um, simply issue stock to cover the cost of that bond if the price went over $360 a share? Or sh should Tesla simply use cash on the balance sheet to eliminate uh, the debt that's due uh, at this time? As we all know, Tesla has $10 billion plus in debt on the books, but the challenge is they have a lot more investing and growing to do. So there's a balancing act between which uh, to do, pay down more debt or issue more stock and retain the cash so you can reinvest in the company. Um, I have to admit that when I looked at what was occurring, I was thinking to myself, the problem right now is that there's a number of things Tesla needs to get done. In particular, they almost need to build half of a factory devoted to building parts for all their cars because all that's happening is an increasing number of cars are on the road and therefore higher potential for those needing repairs or accident repairs, et cetera, et cetera. So you're just having a bigger and bigger parts nightmare uh, that's developing, unfortunately, where customers will suffer and eventually uh, when competitors roll in, they can point to a well-oiled organization to service customer needs. And I think the, the biggest hole in what Tesla is doing right now, certainly there's some issues with deliveries, but the biggest challenge right now is the fact that there are people waiting doing six months in a year to get repair parts. And I actually think this is ridiculous. So the question mark is, 
if you're a bondholder, should you take uh, the 50% cash, 50% uh, equity um, that Tesla is offering? Um, most people who own bonds of that sort are, tend to be fairly well healed or large institutions. And I almost think that what will end up happening is most of the uh, money, debt, et cetera, will simply cash moving from one part of, let's say, Fidelity Investments to another part of the Fidelity Investments based on um, the fact that there are bond funds where people need yield, so they prefer to just roll over back into bonds and get rid of uh, all of the equity and, and cash um, by investing as they're supposed to. Uh, so the question is, what's going to really happen in terms of um, you know, investors? And I think the answer is that um, the, the plan that they have in mind sounds pretty good. But I think that uh, those that have to take the offer will likely be sort of bond buyers and end up sort of taking the deal and rolling into either Tesla's bonds or somebody else's bonds in an effort to uh, stay in the bond business of, of investing cash and getting uh, coupons on a regular basis from that investment. Um, is it good? Is it bad for Tesla? I have to say that I'm very surprised that Tesla chose to go this route. The reason I'm surprised is that uh, every dollar right now is big because they have a lot of investing to do because they're growing fairly quickly. The concern everyone had or the, the big discussion was something called dilution. And what that means is that if, let's say if you have 100 shares of stock and then you issue um, another, you know, say 25 shares of stock, you, the number of outstanding shares increases so everyone that owns a share, the incremental value of that share has a percentage of ownership in the company actually de declines. So the question mark is, is it a good idea for Tesla to um, uh, issue more stock? Um, all the current owners will be somewhat diluted. So um, to some extent, they're keeping some of their cash, but they're also in a position where they're also um, they're keeping their cash, but they're 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 also uh, uh, issuing debt. So there is some dilution, but nothing like the dilution that you would see if, in fact, they had chosen to do all of it in stock. Meaning, in theory, they could simply issue 920 million dollars in stock. Um, this increases the dollar, the market cap of stock that's out there from let's say 70 billion to 71 or 72 billion. And for me, that sounded like a winner strategy because they get to hang on to cash and don't have to issue any new debt in the process. Uh, the follow-on to this is Elon Musk has indicated that right now the Tesla's strategy is to delever the company, so they're going to try and, on a regular basis, um, reduce debt by taking uh, profits and, uh, and, in essence, uh, cutting the amount of debt the company has. Um, there was a piece of information that sort of rolled through that I found interesting, which is that it turns out that in order to enter the S&P as a company, you have to have four quarters of profitability prior to being included in that index, which I think is a pretty important one because it is the biggest index. And so this is kind of uh, bad. Well, the fact of the matter is I wouldn't say it's bad news. I would say that the problem that's going on right now is that uh, – uh, Elon Musk has indicated because of the payments due to bondholders, um, that payment will likely, uh, I'm trying to uh, flex my position in order to control the sun here, and it doesn't seem to be cooperating, so I may have to t uh, t change my orientation to uh, get a better look. Um, so the, the problem that's coming up here is that um, we have a situation where Tesla's bonds are uh, the cost of the capital that's disappearing uh, for Tesla is a big deal. Um, I'm a little surprised because uh, Tesla definitely needs to, to hang on to cash, and they're not doing so right now. So hopefully they can uh, keep the company flowing without burning more cash, and uh, it won't be a big issue. Um, the other thought that comes to mind is in the option space, and the fact is that I primarily deal with equity options on stock or maybe oil or other things. And for those of you who are in our options class, 
I would say that um, there's a whole bunch of interesting things that go on in the bond market that can be very lucrative. And if you're confident in what Tesla is doing, it might be worth doing some investigation to see what instruments you could purchase against the Tesla bonds that would allow you to make some money. Um, so I, a long winded statement to say, I think that in general, um, the news is good. In general, um, I'm kind of shocked right now because if, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we're at November or December 7th of 2018. And it's kind of amazing right now because the stock market is down as much as a thousand points ish in the last week and Tesla's stock price is actually slightly up. So there just seems to be a lot of confidence in the marketplace about A, what Tesla's doing and B, what the future looks like for the company. And therefore it's able to buck the trend of the entire market. So uh, I'd have to say phenomenal um, by the company, uh, phenomenal by buyers who want their products. And I think it's exciting times for Tesla. Um, the next thing I wanted to review today is Tesla's violations on the tes uh, Tesla violations of the McDonald's real estate rule. So to start this section off, I wanted to note that the question for the day is what business is McDonald's in? And the answer that it's the not answer is the hamburger business. And the reason is that when McDonald's went public and nobody wanted to buy into a hamburger chain, so they told the, uh, the, the Wall Street at the time that they're not getting into hamburgers, they're getting into the real estate business. So the agenda of McDonald's was to acquire real estate in terrific locations and then retain those locations long term, simply getting rent from the uh, people who were running the hamburger chain that sat in those locations. So partially because of this, McDonald's is the largest franchisee in the world uh, of any entity, I think at 13,000 stores. Um, this information comes from a book called The McDonald's Way that explained how Ray Kroc built the company. Another footnote on the McDonald's structure is that uh, none of the franchises own the locations. The, they simply pay a franchise fee to control the operating unit there. And one of the main reasons McDonald's has become so big is that uh, instead of, for example, with Burger King, Burger King sells um, hamburgers to the franchiser and then they make money on every hamburger and they make money in a lot of different ways. The only way McDonald's makes money is by a percentage of sales, in essence, taking rent from their owners. And all the trucks you see moving food instead of the McDonald's is simply supplier agreements set up uh, by McDonald's uh, for their franchisees. So by aligning carefully the company with the, look, with the franchisee, you end up with a win-win situation that McDonald's has enjoyed and the fact that real estate's the underpinning of the company makes it easy to finance when they want to. And it also makes the company very stable and it can be profitable on the burgers, but the real estate is the sort of residual value. I bring this up relative to McDonald's or, or Tesla because by our calculations, the 370 acres in Silicon Valley that houses the Fremont plant is worth somewhere between 20 and $30 billion dollars and today you could build a small city on that that would be some of the most expensive real estate in the world. And so Elon Musk has made an effort to avoid uh, purchasing or more real estate. And hence, you'll notice the Model 3 videos that we have over my shoulder, as well as any time you hear about the plant. It's stacked to the gills, uh, floor to ceiling, with technology designed to try to optimize uh, the space they're in vertically because they have a relatively small footprint there. Now, it's a good idea because it saves money um, on more real estate, but the challenge is that if you're doing an auto plan on a flat surface, everything is simpler. When you're having to work in a two to three stories and things moving up and down, you're all of a sudden introducing a lot of variables that can you know, break apart. The conveyor belt comes to mind that Elon Musk had to rip out and replace with, with manpower. So it can be done to build and successfully operate in an environment like that, but you're introducing a whole bunch of other issues 
that are related to the fact that they're tightly squeezed for space. As we've discussed, Tesla is starting has begun leasing large buildings within 25 or 30 miles of their headquarters to house the truck and roadster production as well as um, the growth of the Model 3 in their process. And I think you know that's a good thing that they're doing that, but hopefully they're doing it on, on a lease option basis because continuing to lease real estate that, that over time continues to get really, really expensive means their lease payments are gonna rise over time and they have no equity for in what they're doing. I, as I've shared in other videos, have really been trying to convince through my videos, Tesla consider moving into what's called the Central Valley where uh, the distance from the Fremont plant is only 35 miles, uh, but you're, you have these large former farms that are being sold in pieces and you can get it for dirt cheap to throw up buildings and now you can produce and have plenty of space to operate in and you can own because it's, um, you know, owning in the Central Valley is probably the equivalent of leasing in Silicon Valley. So you, for the same money, you get to own. So I just think it's a good strategy. The second real estate strategy that I've been amazed by with Tesla that I think is sort of ill-conceived is the fact that Tesla has continued to maintain their um, mall-based uh, introduction uh, stores uh, for Tesla. When the company started and nobody knew about them, I thought it made sense to try to use it as an advertising vehicle. So Tesla doesn't spend money in advertising, but it's the equivalent of spending that money by being in all these high-end malls. On the low end, you're talking 10 grand a month for that space, and it could be as much as $20,000 a month that they're spending for those locations. And their advertising is superior, so people know about the car. And Tesla could probably get away now with just putting cars in the middle, you know, in the middle between stores and allowing people to view them that way, which is a lot cheaper than having a dedicated store with employees uh, and riding the curve of all those costs. So I just think that's really fascinating to see what they're doing there. Last footnote, evidently Elon owns uh, five homes in the greater Los Angeles area, primarily focused on housing for his children, but he also uh, makes a point of at least as of a year ago, he made a point of not buying a home near uh, the Tesla facilities. And when he's in town, he tries to stay with one of the Google guys in Palo Alto uh, because they own multiple homes there. And he kind of uses the guest house as much as possible, perhaps hotels or perhaps sleeping on the factory floor as uh, backup solutions. So in general, um, I've gotten this feeling that Elon has a thing where he's averse to uh, um, He's averse to kind of owning real estate if possible. And I find that really strange because um, one of the key repositories of value, let's say for auto companies, particularly auto dealers, is the lots that their companies are sitting on end up becoming really valuable over time. So if Tesla were to acquire land on which their service centers are sitting, et cetera, um, I think that would be an awesome repository of value over time for the company and unfortunately, when you're leasing, you don't get those benefits. So bottom line and the reason for the section being, is this a violation of the McDonald's strategy? Absolutely. If you're going to be on that piece of real estate for the long term, why not try to do a lease option or find a, some other way to try to own it versus having all the value going to the landlords? And um, over time, uh, you could have had uh, a nice appreciating asset. The final thing that I wanted to uh, roll in today was the homework for those of you who are interested in the options uh, class that we're kind of trying to do. Today is a Friday. Um, one of the rules of trading options, if you're not, if you're a newbie and just learning how to do it, is to avoid trading options that expire within 30 days because that can be highly risky. One of the main reasons it's highly risky is that there are individual institutions that have written options out there in the marketplace and they will actually do things like manipulate the stock price to make uh, someone's options not profitable or limit it out of the money. So the homework that I have uh, for those of you interested in trading options is to have you track, for example, for Tesla's stock price, um, the stock price will close today, Friday, December 7th, but 
at, a, at one hour increments, I wanted to have you note what um, the 360, Tesla stock price is at 360. So what is the 360 call at to open the morning? What is the 360 call at at noon? And what is the 360 call at the end of the day? The, and the expiration date, let's say, would be for uh, today, the December 7th expiration, as well as a week from today. The reason I wanted to watch this is that over time, one of the things I've noticed is that for very powerful people, they will systematically move a stock gently to make sure as many people as, as possible lose money on their options. So I would think, would I even look at it, the uh, Tesla 360 calls for today um, are likely to have some volatility. The stock tends to move five to eight points a day. And um, I'm not a registered rep and not telling you to do this, but my expectation today, for example, is that somehow market manipulators will figure out how to lower the price of Tesla stock just below 360 so all the people who have 360 calls lose money. So I have this theory that if there are more calls than puts, there'll be a manipulation to make sure the calls end up out of the money. If there are a whole bunch of puts and not a lot of calls, the opposite might occur. So we'll see if uh, my theory is right. But what happens here is that by spending some time once a week to sort of watch the movement of the stock and typically what it does and notice whether or not it does crazy things on Fridays as op options are about to expire can be useful information out of time over time because you start to get a feel for what's kind of going on and whether or not you you could find a way to make money in the mix of that process. So again, uh, no, notice that there tend to be more calls than puts at every price point and that uh, somehow the puts end up, um, uh, or the, the, the it, it just seems as though the, the stock tends to move to help people lose as much money as possible um, at, on calls. And so we'll see how that plays out today, but I think it's a really good idea to try to understand how this works. Last thing is I'm about to do my 20 leg lifts as we've discussed previously. Remember, uh, don't go to bed without, without eating, uh, you know, at least two hours, perhaps four hours prior. Um, and uh, I need to get my half hour of walk in today if possible. It is a little chilly here in the Washington DC area. Um, wanted to thank you for taking time out to join us once again. Please remember to like, subscribe. We could use your help on Patreon if possible. Um, this is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Tschüss, max gut, au revoir, le hitro, choda hafez. Farvel in Dutch is goodbye. Ni hao ma, Chinese. Sraizvice, Russian. And in Jamaica we say, no respect, walk good man.